here's what we're going to do tonight. We're going we're gonna to grab uh, Isaiah chapter 47, and we're going to get into Isaiah 47. And by God's grace, because it's, it's something very much of us having covered this in the past, uh, it's, it's another declaration, chapter 47, Isaiah, uh, regarding the kingdom of Babylon. Uh, we'll talk about it. We'll read through it. And uh, we'll go from there into things that uh, are necessary for us to talk about tonight in light of what's going on. This has been an amazing uh, news week. Uh, I have to tell you, it's, uh, I'm trying to think of another n a week in the news in my lifetime that's been like this, and I can't think of one. It has been absolutely off the charts uh, Impossible week to keep up with uh, regarding possible uh, events in the world taking shape in light of Bible prophecy. There's a lot of news in the world, but man, is there stuff going on right now that you can point to uh, in the newspaper, in your Bible, on the map, things that are happening. And how do they relate? And we want to be careful. We want to ask the question, do they relate uh, to... Well, what scripture has to say, but wow, what an amazing week. But um, Father, we pray that you'd bless the going forth uh, from the words of Isaiah 3,000 years ago. We pick up now this prophet of God, this amazing prophet, this highly esteemed, and, and rightfully so. Even still today, the Jewish community esteems Isaiah as their uh, primary supreme prophet of all the Hebrew prophets, and for good reason. We know as believers that he's known to us as the evangelical prophet. More prophecies from, Eli from uh, Isaiah appear in the New Testament than any other or all other prophets assembled together. So God, we pray that you'd give us the spirit uh, of understanding and wisdom to take in your word. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. So Isaiah 47, uh, tonight we're looking at a message entitled, God Over All. And that's a good uh, title to have regarding this chapter, uh, God Over All. Uh, beginning way back in Isaiah chapter 40, we began, in fact, if some of you have a study Bible, you can actually see uh, the breakdown in your study Bible. And I highly recommend every Christian ought to own a good study Bible. Uh, I have my favorites. I, if you can get your hands on uh, the Ryrie New King James Version Study Bible. It's off the charts amazing. If you can find it anywhere online for under 150 bucks, buy it. Uh, I've paid up to 350 bucks for them. They're hard to find. Uh, but you don't have to buy that particular Bible, although it's highly rated. It's a great Bible. Uh, but there are op the Open Bible, uh, the uh, Schofield Bible. There's other great study Bibles out there. And a study Bible is different than... than uh, your off-the-shelf Bible. Same Bible, but it's the footnotes. It's the uh, marginal comments by editors or the, the, the professors or those that are included. Great, great stuff. If you look at Isaiah chapter 40, chapter 40 began with God pronouncing um, his uh, judgments and his call to the recovery of the nation Israel. And that's going to continue all the way out to the, the close of the book. Uh, chapter 66. Uh, but way back then, you saw in Isaiah 40, and, and tonight's a good example of, in chapter 47, that God is the intervening God regarding the nation Israel. It's the God of the Bible. It's little, little Elijah, the, the little guy we just dedicated a moment ago, that the, the Lord is Yah or Yahweh. Uh, God's name is Yah, the Bible says. The God of the Bible has a name, uh, the God of Islam has no name. You need to know that. If you're here tonight and you're a Muslim, you, don't, you do not know the name of your God. You need to know that. You call him, you call him uh, Allah, but that is only uh, Arabic for God. God is not a name. You guys, you guys all know that, right? God's not a name. God is a given uh, title. What you want to do is you want to know your God by name. If your God can't tell you his name, you ought not to make him your God. And the Bible announces that God is Yahweh or Yah. That's why in your Bibles you'll see capital Y, capital A, 
capital H, in various parts of your scriptures where God says, my name is Yah, that's who I am, I am God. Your God, the Christian God, the the Judeo-Christian God has a name, and Yah is that name, Yahweh, meaning salvation, I save, that's my name, Savior, salvation. And it's amazing because his name, which is eternal, has brought forth uh, that description or is synonymous with that description of you and I being delivered. And uh, you just needed, that's not in my notes, you just needed to know that tonight, that the Christian God has a name. It's not God. The, the Lord, Yah, Yahweh, is God. And uh, that's vital that you, that you know that. Uh, but listen, uh, talking about Isaiah 40, Getting into chapter 47, Isaiah 40, verse 1 says, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. In other words, God has singled out Israel to reveal himself to her, but because she's rejected God, She also receives double the punishment. To whom much is given, much is required, says the Bible. And so the Lord is saying in Isaiah 40, uh, she's gone through a lot because of her sins. Verse 3, Isaiah 40, verse 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Anybody recognize that? John the Baptist used that. God inspired John the Baptist to speak that regarding Christ's advent. Prepare the way of the Lord. That's Yah. There's his name right there. You see capital L-O-R-D in your Bible, in the English Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, it says, prepare the way of Yah, his name. It's awesome. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Great declaration. So now we come to Isaiah chapter 47, where God continues to speak out against, listen, both his people and Babylon. He speaks out against his people because they've rebelled against him. He speaks out against Babylon because even though God used them to chastise his wayward nation, Babylon abused God's people. And he's going to hold them accountable for that. And again, I've mentioned this to you before. You might want to write it down in your margins. Is Isaiah chapter 47, like the book uh, of Isaiah, so incredibly powerfully prophetic. But Isaiah 47 is speaking about Babylon and just mar- write this down in your margins, that Babylon, at the time of this prophecy, is a- just a village. It's not even on the blip of the map or the radar of being a global power. You need to know that. It's amazing. See, we assume that God is speaking to Isaiah right now, or, excuse me, to Babylon through Isaiah, and Babylon is some tremendous power and some great thing. God is speaking prophetically. It's absolutely remarkable. So look with me in chapter 47, verse 1. To this, we're looking at the Lord who preserves Israel. God, the Lord, preserves Israel. He's God over all, and this is what he does, and he's made this promise. And so he says, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. He's speaking against Babylon. Sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For you shall no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal. Remove your veil. Take off the skirt. Uncover the thigh. Pass through the rivers. Your nakedness shall be uncovered. God's speaking judgment against Babylon, and yet it's future. Yes, your shame will be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not uh, arbitrate with a man. Verse 4, as for our Redeemer. This is Isaiah speaking now. Verse 4, he's speaking Isaiah, about his nation, Israel. As for our Redeemer, the Lord, there's the name Yah, of host is his name. The Holy One of Israel. Verse 5, now he goes back to Babylon. Sit in silence and go into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you shall no longer be called the Lady of Kingdoms. Now this is amazing. You might say, what does that mean? Well, first of all, highlight verse 4. That is a, that's a, a, a parenthetical insert where God speaks through the prophet condemning Babylon. And then verse 4, Isaiah speaks to the nation reminding Israel that the Lord is our Redeemer. He's going to get us out of that, of that problem that's going to happen 
in the future. And, he, and God addresses Babylon prophetically as the lady of kingdoms. What does that mean? It's amazing. According to the best archaeological evidence that has been discovered, and you can visit it today in various parts of the world, the British Museum, probably the best in the world, but the evidence of archaeological discovery is not some, it's not a lot, but it's all regarding Babylon being the mother or the lady, it says here, of kingdoms, meaning that Babylon has for millennia been the place of pagan worship. Babylon. If, if you look at a religious practice today, you can trace its roots all the way back to ancient Babylon. Babylon has been used by Satan or by God to be this particular depository of the religions or the cults of the world, excluding Judeo-Christian biblical faith. It's remarkable. Everything else, you name it. The belief, for example, if you study the theology of the cults that are predominant in America, you got to look past the, the Americanness of, of cults. For example, think of Jehovah Witnesses. Forget about the fact that they were founded by an American, founded not all that long ago. Forget about that part. Look at what the belief system is, and you can trace it all the way back to Babylon. It's, it's amazing. Uh, you pick it, and whatever it is, you can trace it back to ancient Babylon. And you guys probably know by now that out of Babylon came 360 different gods. Why 360? Because the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is based upon a 360-day calendar, not 365 like you and I have. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation is based on a 360-day year. The Babylonians, it's a hexadecimal system, 360, our navigational uh, uh, tools, 360. Uh, the, the, your compass works on 360. Babylon had a God for every day of the year. And they had a worship for that system. It's pretty amazing. But when you come to the name Babylon, you, you need to make a note of the fact that when you come to Babel, Babylonian, Babylon, that it's all speaking about this pagan type system. God is saying, okay, Babylon, you've been this way. Prophetically is announcing, you're going to mistreat Israel. I'm going to deal with you. You're going to come to nothing. Even though you are called the lady of the kingdoms, the mother, the womb of false religions, Babylonianism. Uh, have you ever heard of the horoscope? We'll talk more about this in a moment. But have you ever heard of the horoscope? Anybody? Have you ever heard of the zodiac? Those things? Babylonian. Babylonian, and they're very much alive today, even in our 21st uh, century culture. But God has promised to preserve Israel, even through what will come to her under the powers of Babylon. Babylon will take control. Look at verses uh, 6 to 15 now. He says, and now we're talking about the Lord judging Israel's enemies. He says, I was angry with my people. That's Israel. I have profaned, the word means I've let them go. So God says, I'm angry with my people Israel. They've turned on me. They do not believe. They've not listened to my prophets. Uh, they've rebelled, so I've, I've let them go. I've, they want to run? I have, I'm going to let them run. Uh, he calls them my inheritance. Throughout the Bible, God calls Israel his inheritance. And given them into your hand. That's Babylon. But you showed them no mercy, and on the elderly, you laid your yoke very heavily. And you said, this is Babylon speaking, uh, I shall be a lady forever. But listen what the Lord has to say about that. He says, so that you did not take these things to heart, nor remember the latter end of them. So all the nations of all of humanity have their connection in their religious worship system to Babylon. And what's amazing, church, is to keep this in mind, this Babylonianism is of the mindset and of the world system, the spiritual system that says, we will establish, now listen to this, we will establish our kingdom 
on earth. This is what the, the, the cults believe. This is what false religions believe. Uh, we'll take the earth and we'll establish our kingdom. Listen, that's what ISIS is all about. We'll take the earth. That's what Islamic, uh, the caliphate is all about. Let's take the globe and we'll make it our own. And it's just not Islam. It's other, other religions. You say, well, Jack, doesn't Christianity teach the same thing? Uh, no, it does not. Christianity, the Bible does not teach Listen, does not teach. I have to underscore that because there are people who uh, hold to some bizarre uh, kingdom theology that says, as Christians, we need to vote for all the right people. Look, I'm for voting for all the right people. Just know this. You can vote for all the right people, but you're not going to bring into the kingdom. The kingdom's not going to come by your vote. But people will say, well, we're, we're going to do this and we're going to create a utopia. We're going we're gonna to create this place. Listen, every Christian who's read their Bible knows you cannot create uh, and mandate a Christian nation. Now, was America founded on Judeo-Christian beliefs and principles? Absolutely. You can't deny it. It's an absolute fact. But no founding father nor the pilgrims ever believed for a moment that they were going to create a nation whereby everybody within it is a Christian. This is the genius of our government that was founded, is that it was created by believers who said it's okay to be a non-believer. You can't force that upon anybody. But cult mentality is, we're going to create this global entity of our power, of our influence. Listen, that's what communal living is all about. They can't do it on a grand scale, so they'll do it on a small scale. Listen, in a sense... In a sense, that's what, that's what monasticism is. You know what that is, right? Where you, you're going to be a monk, you're going to go into a place, and you're going to create a world that is spiritual, and it's isolated from the real world that's out there. But because you can't establish a global entity of what you want to do, you create a little tiny version of it. And it's all goofy. It's goofy. However, you and I are living in an age right now, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, you're certainly living in the, the beginnings of it where Satan is going to attempt to do this globalization and we would call it a, um, well, what's the term that's out there? We call it one world government or one world order, yeah, whatever. It goes by various names. And, you know, what's the, what's the premise behind all of that? that we, we've got to stop war. Now, this sounds good. Listen, we've got to stop all wars. We have to stop all injustice. We have to stop all evil, and we're all for that. But how you achieve that, the Christian is completely separate from all others in the world. Because the Christian knows that the Bible teaches there'll never be global peace. There'll never be the removal of injustice until Christ returns. He's the one. But the world is, can I say hell-bent? It's hell-bent, for real, right now. On what? On finding a leader who will bring about a utopia where everyone has the same stuff, everyone is treated the same, everyone has uh, equal existence, and we all march to this drummer, the bummer is the Bible tells us that, that the, the drummer is the false prophet and he's drumming a tune for the Antichrist. Mr. 666. You all aware? Maybe some of you in here are not Christians, but you are aware. Everybody's aware of 666 in Revelation chapter 13. A global leader who is going to do first as an imposter what Christ will do later forever. And you need to remember that spirit of cult-type thinking. But the Bible says that God is going to judge uh, those nations. In fact, Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, the Bible says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, that's Jesus Christ in the second coming, not the rapture, the second coming, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. What's amazing is that right now tonight in heaven, Jesus is not seated upon the throne of his glory. Don't you think he is? But he's not. You say, well, Pastor, I, I, I thought he was. Nope. 
Listen, Jesus is in heaven, and he's seated at the right hand of God the Father, but the throne of his glory is his earthly rule, his earthly reign, as promised in the Old Testament. Jesus must sit on the throne of David. That's the throne of his glory, and it's on earth. Friends, listen, you know that Jesus has never sat on a throne on earth yet. But for Jesus to be the biblical Jesus, he must sit on a throne. Listen, the Bible is very specific. In fact, I'll quiz you. He has to sit upon an earthly throne. Whose throne is it? David's throne. Where is it? It has to be Jerusalem. How long will he sit on that throne? A thousand years, a millennium. That's what the Bible says. Jesus has never done that. He's going to do that. And the Bible says that when he does that, Matthew 25, 32, all the nations will be gathered together before him and he will separate them. Who? The nations. One from another as a shepherd or like a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats and he will set the sheep on one hand and the goats on uh, the other hand or on the left. The sheep to the right, the goats to the left. And those sheep or goat type of nations, not people, I mean they're people, but they're judged by nations. They're going to be divided when Christ comes back in the second coming and those who are on his right hand, they will live into the millennial kingdom. Those that are on, those referred to as goats, they're destroyed by Christ and his righteousness. This happens at the second coming. It's remarkable. It's awesome. He will judge the nations. And he's going to speak out to Babylon, and he's going to judge Babylon. He's going to judge America. He's going to judge Saudi Arabia. He's going to judge Canada. He's going to judge the nations. And the word implies that he'll be judging the leaders as well. Boy, uh, talk about drain the swamp. It's going to happen when Jesus comes back. I mean, he's going he's to drain the swamp and, and everything. And he's going to judge with perfect judgment when he comes. Absolute righteousness. Just amazing. Verse, um, verse 8, therefore, hear this now, you who are given to pleasures. He's speaking to Babylon, who dwell securely. This is an amazing, uh, amazing statement. We'll look at this in a moment. Remember this, though. Remember verse 8. He's, he's warning those who live in pleasure. He's warning them who dwell in uh, d- dwell in security or securely. Who say in your heart, I am and there is no one else besides me. I shall not sit as a widow, nor shall I know the loss of children. But these two things shall come to you in a moment, in one day. The loss of children, the loss of of, or you, the loss of children and widowhood. They shall come upon you in their fullness because of the multitude of, and here we're, here's where it gets interesting, your sorceries in the New King James Version. The word in the Hebrew is things or all things, listen, it's hard to say this, all things witchcrafts. <laughs> Witchcraft, not singular, witchcrafts. God says, I'm going to devastate those who practice uh, witchcraft, plural, witchcrafts, the crafts of sorcery. You say, Jack, really? I mean, God's going to waste his time with that? Oh, no, it's no waste of time because it's real. Demonism, Satanism is real. Sorcery is real. Witchcraft is real. That's why God condemns it. It's real. If it wasn't real, he wouldn't deal with it. It's not a joke. There's real powers. And some of them begin or seem to look innocent. Uh, Ouija boards. um, You know, those tarot card things, the readers, palm readers, all that kind of stuff. You know that weird eight ball thing that you you can buy it at Toys R Us. That stuff is, is... like channeling, looking for answers, things like this, seances, those, that's more extreme. Uh, spiritism. God says, I condemn all that. In fact, in the Old Testament, if you practice those things, you were put to death. You say, man, God is intolerant. Uh, listen, God doesn't stand for evil, and here's the deal. We may say, or the human might say, well, that's very intolerant of God to, to do that. 
well, listen, we might think so as humans because we're blind and dumb to the reality that there are demon powers behind those things and involving themselves in idols. The Bible tells us, Paul the Apostle warns that when people bow down to idols, they're bowing down to demons. You say, well, I, what? The demons will inhabit a statue. They'll inhabit things, demons. It's legendary and it's biblical. It's not a joke. And God says, I'm going to deal with that stuff. And so he's talking about that he's going to judge those who find um, their pursuits in spiritual things, but they leave God out of it completely. And then he says, for the great abundance of your enchantments. Wow, this is heavy. The word enchantments means your charm casters. Listen, this gets wild. Charm casters, spell casters. The word is occult practitioners. Those who speak, listen, the word means to speak uh, to the living from the point of the dead. You ever seen that stuff? There's people on TV that do this. There's that one guy, I don't know whatever happened to him, maybe he died. Do you know that one guy, remember that guy that was on TV all the time? Whatever that guy is. He was, he would, he, uh, you would say, you know, on this show, they would say, oh, you know, my grandmother died years ago and I miss her and stuff. And he would say, oh, your grandmother is, yes, she's speaking to me and she, she told me to tell you to brush your teeth and, and remember to, you know, really, have you ever seen that show? And you say, oh, that's entertaining. God says, it's demonic. <laughs> oh, come on. Hey, you know what? That's exactly how the satanic world would have you to think. Oh, it's just lighthearted fun. I, um, years ago, I was uh, innocently, Lisa and I were just coming home from somewhere, and there was somebody to... <laughs> there to meet us in the yard and this guy wanted to talk and um, I'll make a four hour story really short uh, this guy said I need to talk to you um, but years ago I was playing with a Ouija board I thought it was fantastic I saw this thing it actually started moving in front of me without my hands on it I was enamored by that. I went to bed that night. I fell asleep. And he said, then this great, huge image appeared in my room, very dark. And he said, I knew exactly who it was. And I was terrified. And um, that voice, a voice came to me and said, you need to pledge allegiance to me. And he said, I did that. And he said, now I need to get out of that world that's been, I, and this guy was, at the time, this guy's like 35 years old now. And it had been more than half of his life lived where he's been under this, power and this influence and it was amazing because the things that this guy was saying to, to me um, was definitely not of this world in sound you could hear these sounds coming up from his mouth and yet it sounded like a, he was speaking through a pipe that was 50 feet away and speaking to this guy and, and listening to him and I, and I realized this is absolutely not of this world and I began quoting scripture and the guy's eyes in his face, his eyes turned absolutely jet black right in front of me. And this went off and on for a space of four hours and the guy left shaking, crying. He would not accept Christ and he told me the last thing I ever heard him say ever is he said, I'm in so much trouble now. I never should have talked to you. I never should have questioned him, he said. I never should have, I went like this. I, I never should have questioned him. I'm in trouble and I'm, I'm afraid for my life. This man was kept and bound by demonic activity. Not too long ago, um, I was involved, a few of us here, staff, involved with a counseling session of a young girl whose family was involved in Satanism, still is involved in Satanism. And uh, this young teenage girl uh, had bite marks up and down the back of her spine, her, her, her neck, all the way down to her back end, bottom. And they were not there one night, and then they were there the next night. And she recounted the dream that she had. And how do you explain that kind of stuff? It's that, listen, if you think Christianity is boring, you're doing it wrong. You ought to sign up and be involved in ministry. It'll freak you out. It's real stuff. And you might be saying, uh, what? I don't get that. Read your Bible. God says, I am going to deal with the enchanters, the spellcasters, those who are mediums that speak on behalf of the dead. God does not take it lightly. 
and it's Babylonianism. And yet it's growing in America today. You can't drive down the street of communities and there's palm readers, tarot cards. It's not a joke. Yet people are all enamored by that. They won't read their Bibles, but they'll go to these knucklehead things to find out about their future. Do you remember Chloe, Cleo? The woman that was with the turban and stuff on TV I had all the commercials? She, if you called her up and paid the money, she'd tell you your future? Isn't it funny that she went bankrupt? <laughs> Couldn't she see that coming? <laughs> Verse 10, for you have trusted in your wickedness and you have said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge have warped you. And you have said in your heart, I am, and there is no one else besides me. Therefore, evil shall come upon you, and you shall not know where uh, it arises, and trouble shall fall upon you. You will not be able to put it off, and desolation shall come upon you suddenly, which you shall not know. Verse 12, stand now with your enchantments and the multitudes, or the multitude of your sorceries. Uh, in which you have labored from your youth. Perhaps you will be able to profit. Perhaps you will prevail. That's actually, God is mocking them right now. Verse 13, you are wearied in the multitude of your counselors or counsels. It's the advisors. You have listened to all of these advisors that you've chosen. It's not, it's not good when elected officials <laughs> uh, consult mediums regarding their government practices. Did you know that? Do you know that happens in America? You have elected officials who are praying and seeking what uh, witchcraft people to counsel them on what to do. How about listening to the constituents who put them in office? No. Elected officials wind up getting elected and then they go to I'm not joking. I wish I was joking where they'll go and they'll consult spiritists regarding what decisions they should make. That is absolutely remarkable. God says, I see all that stuff. I'm watching that. Amazing. So you can become wearied in the multitude of your advisors. Let now the astrologers. Now look, in, look at your Bible carefully because some of your translations may be different in some of your uh, versions of your Bible. So let now the astrologers the stargazers and the monthly prognosticators stand up and save you from what shall come upon you. God is mocking them. It's a sarcasm. Remarkable. The word astrologers in Hebrew, it's habar. It's where we get the word, listen, it's hard to say, uh, horoscopist. So what is a horoscopist? The Bible in Hebrew says habar. It's those who practice the art of horoscope. Horoscope comes from the Babylonian zodiac. The zodiac consulting the heavens for answers on how to run your life. Now, who in the world would fall for such stupid things as that? And yet people have apps of this stuff. People consult their horoscope daily. Did you know, church, that it's demonic? The horoscope is Babylonian demonism. Yeah, but you know what? It's right. Is it really right? It's like a fortune cookie. Go to P.F. Chang's. <laughs> get a fortune cookie. And what are you going to hear? Nothing but good news. Has a horoscope or a fortune cookie ever said, tomorrow you're going to get a flat tire, your dog's going to bite you, and you're going to get a cold? No, it's always, you're going to meet an interesting person that your future is about to begin. <laughs> Have you noticed that? It's all this junk. But God warns us, astrologers. And then, stargazers. The stargazers, the word is those who consult the movement of the heavens. The Stonehenge cult group, things like that. The pyramid cultists where we'll get our answers. Or the Mayan. Yes, the Mayans, they were so accurate. Oh, they were amazing. You can watch programs. The stargazers. God says, I condemn the stargazers. Oh, but the Mayans were amazing. They were so advanced. If they were so advanced, and if the stars were telling them, based on their temples, you know, their amazing temples, then what happened to them? 
They were exterminated in, the, in, the, in short order. And then if that wasn't enough, we're so dumb that, was it 2012, the Mayan calendar? Huh? Oh, 2000? What does, whenever. It was, it was in this millennium that the Mayan calendar gave an announcement about what's going to happen in the world. Why would we listen to that stuff? People are desperate. And when you reject the Bible, you go after stuff that's, that's not even... Remember, is it Jean Dixon? A prophetess. False prophetess. Hey, here's one that would get people all riled up if you're a History Channel fan. It, you don't touch this guy, you're going to get a fight on your hands, and yet the guy is pathetically inaccurate, is Nostradamus. The guy's a total quack. And yet History Channel, they reject all the prophets of the Bible, and they take Nostradamus and they make him into a, a, an incredibly reliable prophet. And his prophecies are absolutely something that you, if you read him, you'd have a whole different meaning. And then if you read it over here, you'd have a whole different meaning than this guy. It's absolutely crazy. When God speaks to his prophets, it is what it is. And the Bible challenges us to test God's prophetic word. And then the monthly uh, prognosticators. This, uh, if this wasn't so funny, it'd make me angry. These are people who are, they're, they're, they're um, ancient Babylonian priests, and their gig was this. We'll tell you what to do with your life this month. Next month, come back, and we'll tell you what to do with your life. We'll tell you who to marry. We'll tell you what to buy. We'll tell you what to plant. We'll tell you where to live. Jesus, by the way, referred to them in the New Testament as Nicolaitans. Nico, lords, laity, laitans, laity, the people, they were lords over the people. They lorded their will over the people. And Jesus said, Jesus said, I hate that. People do it today. God told me to tell you. <laughs> Don't listen to people that say that. It diminishes God's ability. It's a mockery of God. God told me to tell you. And, no, no, listen, God is able to tell you yourself. And you say, well, God told me to tell you because God told me to tell you first that you're not listening to God. That's why God told me to come and tell you. <laughs> so now someone is sitting in judgment on your relationship with God. And you've all heard it. You've all experienced it. I've heard it all. God told me to tell you. I got, right now, I'm not going to share with you what, what, I got two dueling prophets that have come into my life. One prophet said one thing unaware that the other prophets said another thing. They're completely opposite of each other, but they're prophets of God. And I'm waiting for the time to pass because they gave me dates. <laughs> and so I'm waiting for time to pass. Then I'm going to let them know that this prophet said this, but this prophet said the other. Both claim to be from God. Believe me, someone's got to be wrong. Okay, probably both of them. <laughs> So be careful, just Bible, okay, you'll, you'll be fine. And so, stand up and save uh, you from what shall come upon you. Verse 14, behold, they shall be as stubble, the fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. It shall not be a coal to be warmed by, nor a fire to sit before. Thus shall they be to you who, with whom you have labored, your merchants from your youth. They shall wander each one to his quarter. No one shall save you. All of this said by God from his prophet Isaiah in defense of Israel, his people, against Babylon. Church, think about the cultures that have come against Israel that God warned them, told them, and they are no more in human history. When was the last time you met an Assyrian or a Hittite? When was the last time? You see, you go through the cultures where God says, you mess with my people and I'm going to destroy you. When's the last time you met a Philistine? Just go down the list. And modern day, I don't, I've showed you the list before, but modern day times, when you look at the empires of human history that attacked Israel... Notice, they're all gone. Every one of them is destroyed. The last one in modern times, well, the, one, the, the Persian Empire is, 
in a sense, is about to attack Israel again, reconstituted. So they're going to be dealt with soon. We'll talk about that in a second. But think about Nazism, the empire of Nazism. Where's Hitler? Can you imagine? Hitler thought he was going to exterminate the Jews. Listen, the Jews weren't the issue. The Jews were not the issue. Hitler, when you, if you attack a Jew, you're going after the God of the Jews. That's what you want to be careful about. Well, you know, those Jews, those, they own everything. Well, they're smarter than us, that's why. <laughs> you say, how dare you say that? That's a, very, that's a very terrible thing to say. No, it's not. It's 100% accurate. Which people group in all of humanity wins more Nobel Prizes? The Jews. Hands down. No other culture comes. Honkies don't even get close. <laughs> we don't even, My people group, Portuguese, we just know how to fish, and I don't even know how to do that. <laughs> no, there's a high probability if you're Jewish, you're going to win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> They're brilliant. Greatest technologies in the world right now coming out of Israel, and they have been for the last 40 years. Your cell phone and your iPad. I don't know if you know this or not. You might, you might be here today or you're watching right now and you, you hate the Jewish people. Well, then throw away your iPad and your iPhone because of the guts on the inside. It's all Jewish. Your phone might look Gentile, but on the inside, it's, a, <laughs> it's Jew. You have a Jewish phone. You'd be shocked how many apps you have on your device that's Jewish. Seriously. If you have a navigational device on your phone or on your iPad or on your watch, it's Jewish. So, so what's going on right now? God says, don't mess with my people. Well, right now, this has been an ama amazing week in the news. We're going to look at some of this stuff shifting gears today, and we're living in an amazing times, church. Isaiah 47 was 3,000 years ago, but I'm telling you right now, the God of Isaiah is still alive. The God of the Jews, he's just rolling up his sleeve, so to speak. And um, in the news, I want to show you this slide. First slide I want you guys to see is, uh, and this is all over the world right now. The Iranian army chief warns Israel will not survive next 25 years. This guy, this guy, he's their new, their, he's their new boss, uh, Iranians, the Persians. And this guy's saying Israel's done. He said 25 years. He's revised that, by the way, since he says Israel is soon to be completely annihilated from off the earth, and Iran, Persia is going to be the country to do it. That's what he's boasting. That's what he's saying. He's talking about his, his leadership. As an Iranian general, he's going to do it. Okay? Apparently he has no knowledge of the Bible. You don't, talk, you don't talk like that to the God of Israel. You take on Israel. Just know this, everybody. You take on Israel, and you're swinging at the God of heaven. It never works. It never turns out good for you. If that's what you're going to do. The Bible says in Joel chapter 3, verse 1, For behold, in those days and at that time when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, that means when God regathers his people, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, Kidron Valley. That's between the Dome of the Rock Mosque or the Temple Mount today and the Mount of Olives. Many of you have walked with us right across that pathway. It's very short. It's very small. And, uh, and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people. God says, my people. Who are they? My heritage Israel, whom they, that is the world, have scattered among the nations. Isn't that amazing? God says the world, what they did previously is that they scattered the Jewish people among the nations. Listen, did that happen? Wow. For the last 2,000 years. They have also divided up my land. This is God of the Bible talking. Is, Israel, is it always in the news that someone's trying to divide up Israel's land? Amazing. They have cast lots for my people, took them into captivity, used them as slaves. Has that happened? Wow. Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. God says in the context again is the children of Abraham. He says, I will curse him who curses you. God says to Abraham, from your descendants, I'll bless those who bless your descendants. But concerning those who curse your descendants, I'll curse them. And I'm just laying this out before you tonight. Has that happened in history? In fact, the only thing, in my opinion, I'm probably going to get hate mail on this, but uh, 
the, the, the reason why America is, is great or was great or is great, maybe could be great again, is, is not because of our financial prowess or our military. It's because it's the God of the Bible. That's the only way that America could become great again. It's the only way America became great was the God of the Bible. Okay? We want to be careful about that. And America has had a history like no other nation on earth of blessing Israel. So keep that in mind. Zechariah 12, verse 1. This message concerning the fate of Israel came from the Lord. This message is from the Lord who stretched out the heavens, laid the foundations of the earth, and formed the human spirit. I will make Jerusalem like an intoxicating drink that makes the nearby nations stagger when they send their armies to besiege Jerusalem and Judah. That's going to happen. It's happened in history. It's going to happen again. That's the near and far fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Verse 3, Zechariah 12. On that day, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock. In other words, Jerusalem to the nations will be a very stubborn thing. And I ask you tonight, is that true? All the nations will be gathered against it to try to move it, but they will only hurt themselves, God says. Psalm 83. All of these things are genre together regarding Israel in the last days. Psalm 83. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace. And do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies, notice, your enemies, the nations, God, are attacking you. Your enemies make a tumult. And those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against what does it say, church? Your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. Verse 4, they have said, so before I read it, has Iran said this? Is Syria saying this? Is Iraq? Is Lebanon? Is who? Notice who's saying this stuff. They've said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation. Sounds like... What's going on at the UN? That the name of Israel may be remembered no more. The, the president of Iran just said that recently. Let's destroy Israel from off the face of the earth. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against uh, you, the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagarites, Gibal, Ammon, I uh, list the Philistines, Philistia. By the way, Philistia is the ancient word. The word Philistia means uh, invader or wandering foreigner. Philistia is the root word to modern day Palestine. The Palestine, Palestine is a Roman uh, presentation. In 135 AD, Emperor Hadrian of Rome renamed Israel after the Philistines to insult the Jews and called it Palestine. It's the way the Italians would say it. Philistia is what the Bible says. It means foreigners or wandering invaders. That's what the word means. Pretty amazing, right? So God is talking about a time of the near and far fulfillment. When he talks about these prophets, I just... Uh, mentioned to you about. I showed this to you many, I might have been a year ago. I want you to keep this in mind. When God speaks, there's the near, and it's called eschatology, the study of prophetic doctrine. When God speaks prophetically, there's a near fulfillment of it, and there's a far fulfillment of it. So what does that mean? When Isaiah, for example, spoke something that would happen, Part of it took place in a very immediate short-term period of time, but the full, total fulfillment of it will be the far, the far completion or fulfillment. They're near fulfillment, far fulfillment. And when you read the Bible, it looks like two things. I want to show you this picture because it's a really perfect picture where we live here in the Southland. You guys recognize that mountain immediately. What's it called? Class. It's Saddleback. What? It's Saddleback Mountain. Okay, here's the deal. Look at it carefully. It looks like one mountain, that that's one mountain. It's not one mountain. It's two separate peaks. What's unique about Saddleback Mountain 
is perfect analogy for the near and far fulfillment when you look at Bible prophecy. You want to be very careful when you read Bible prophecy that you read the entire Bible to understand it. Why? You can take an airplane and fly 360 degrees all the way around Saddleback Mountain, and Saddleback Mountain keeps the shape of a saddle because of the way the mountain is laid out, or the mountain peaks, plural, are laid out, whatever angle you fly, it retains that saddleback look. In the middle are valleys. So Isaiah would speak, or Ezekiel would speak, and the mountain peak on the left would be the near fulfillment. Then there would be a valley of time. Could be, a, could be 50 years, could be 3,000 years. And the far fulfillment would be the peak on the right, and that's how God speaks. So you might say, well, Jack, the verses you read a moment ago, oh, that's already happened. Yes and no. It happened in a small scale, but it will happen in the total scale. And the qualifier is what is called, you've heard this, the last days. That's the qualifier, and it's quite remarkable when you study that. But today, church, we're living in an amazing time, and I want to run through this uh, because this has been an amazing, amazing week. Um, regarding the United States right now in the news and what's happening, and please don't get upset with me. I'm just, I love America. I'm, I'm, I'm glad it's my country, having said that, and, and I support it. But I want to ask you this question. Um, how do you eat, as people ask, how do you eat an elephant? What's the, how do you, what's the answer? One bite at a time. Okay? At this hour, now, right now, the fall of 2017, are you aware that the United States military is at its weakest in 73 years? You should ask the question, how did that happen? The answer is, Obama's administration literally weakened the United States military, and that is a matter of fact, and I'm not being political in saying so, I'm being prophetic. See, what does that have to do with anything? Remember how you eat an elephant. America's military, especially our Navy, our Air Force, God help us, our pilots are, they're being, recently we've had deaths in our Navy and our Air Force because of faulty equipment. Now's the time, if you're going to eat the elephant one bite at a time, now's the time for the enemies of America to attack. Right now, aggressively, the Trump administration is out to rebuild and strengthen the U.S. military. If you're the enemy of America, you cannot let much time go by and let that happen, or else you lose your window of opportunity. Are you with me? Yes. Liberals don't want to hear this kind of thinking. Or theorists. Don't talk like that. This is a reality. And this is what's happening to the nation that you live in right now. See, what does that have to do with Isaiah 47? Just watch. It has everything to do with it. Don't mess with Israel. God will attack her enemies. So listen. Beginning with the Afghanistan-Iraq war. When was that? 1992 or 3? Remember that? First Gulf War. The United States suffered not only a military defeat, but a severe, worse than the military defeat has been our psychological defeat of the first F, uh, Iraqi war. Nobody wants to hear this, and it's an absolute fact. We have suffered a great defeat. Secondly, continuing on, in recent defeats of the US military in the Middle East, and a complete loss. Did you know, church, tonight, and all this has to do with prophecy. The church, did you know, you guys, that we have completely abandoned and lost all of our influence in the Middle East when it comes to uh, that region of the world? And does anybody know what nation has taken our place? Very good, Russia. How did that happen? We absolutely surrendered in the last eight years our influence in the Middle East. You see, what does that have to do with anything? This has to happen. It's tragic. It has to happen. Because if we understand the Bible right, America has got to be severely weakened for the fulfillment of the Ezekiel chapter 38 prophecy that is imminent, in my opinion. The United States has lost all support, and Trump's trying to regain it regarding NATO. We've abandoned our NATO nations. 
and this is not a good thing. North Korea fires this week, new type of ballistic missile capable of reaching mainland United States. This is completely different. Everybody's talking about it. You saw it on the news tonight if you were home, that the launch of this nuclear intercontinental ballistic missile marks a new level of regime uh, capabilities. And President Trump has responded by saying, I can only tell you that we will take care of it. And the general tonight said on television that the United States will, in fact, take care of this regional and now international threat by Kim Jong-un. Because the missile that they launched caught us off guard. This missile that they launched uh, flew 53 minutes before they, the North Koreans blew it up. It had accomplished what they needed, and so they detonated it. They, they stopped it, uh, and it went into the uh, Japan Sea, off the coast of Japan, flew for 53 minutes, and it entered into space. As soon as it happened, as soon as that happened, you can look on a map later on that now not only has been L.A. and Seattle been within range, but now Colorado Springs, which is key to our strategic response, the Midwest, key, Nebraska, key to your defense, is now within striking range of North Korea, and Chicago now, as of yesterday, is within strike range of a nuclear missile from North Korea. You would say, well, who cares about North Korea? Well, where have you been? This is a real deal. The world now is looking to America to stop Kim Jong-un. Now, Trump is telling China, China supplies 96% of North Korea's oil and energy, and the United States is saying, China, cut them off, dry them up, or else we're going to take care of it. We're on the brink of war, ladies and gentlemen. You could wake up any day now to a war on your TV screen. This is not a joke. You see, what does that have to do with anything? Just hang on. Next slide. It's such a serious issue. Maybe you saw it on the news. CNN. For the first time since the end of the Cold War, Hawaii will test nuclear sirens. This is now going to happen in Hawaii, on the Hawaiian Islands, also Guam and Midway, every month now, and evacuation drills. You can read that full-blown article later at your leisure. It's a long one, but... They're, they've already told the Hawaiian populace that they can expect 18,000 uh, people to die within the first several minutes of a, of a uh, North Korean attack. They told the Hawaiians this already this week. It's not a joke. Not a joke. At present, there has been a momentary reprieve as the U.S. is favoring Israel. Listen to this. The U.S., is currently in full support of Israel and is even spending, uh, sending uh, a renewed message to the world. Now, this is if, if we're going to be protected, this is how I think it's going to happen. Um, this was said in the news this week. This is an amazing week. We're only halfway through the week. Uh, Pence says that Trump's actively considering embassy move in Israel. Now, tonight... Tonight, Israel, Israeli news says that Trump's announcement regarding the relocation of the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem is imminent. What does that mean? That means if the United States recognizes the ancient capital of Israel as Jerusalem, the Muslim world refuses for that to happen. It will pit the United States against the Islamic world. And I don't know if you, how much of Islam you know and how much you've read the Quran. I don't encourage it. It would drive you crazy. But as long as Jerusalem exists within Israel, the, the Quran cannot come to pass. The Quran cannot be fulfilled in Islamic theology. That's why on Islamic maps, there is no Israel and there is no Jerusalem on an Islamic map. They cannot recognize that. I'm not making it up. You can go study this on your own. If the United States continues to stand firm in support of Israel, maybe we have some time. Maybe God is saying to America and its leadership, if you will bless those who I bless, I'll bless you. If you curse them, who, then I'll curse you. Maybe right now we've got this theater of war looming with Iran, Russia, and Turkey in the Middle East. America's tired, you know that? 
We're tired of war. We've been at war since how long? It's been 16, 17 years in the Middle East now. We're tired of it. Do you think, you think our nation can stomach another involvement with Russia, going up against Russia? You think we're going to be able to take on Russia and Turkey and Iran at the same time? Let's be honest. If you think maybe, then think about this. At the exact same time something's going to happen in the Middle East, I believe, it's my opinion, that that's exactly the same time something's going to happen with North Korea. So America's got to go like this. <laughs> we won't know what to do, and we won't have the means to do anything about it. This is a critical time. And just today, Iran, which is Shia, Persia, Shia Islam, it's a different sect than the Sunnis, the Saudi Arabians, Sunnis, and the Persians, Iran, Shia, they're about ready to clash. One of those, in Islamic thinking, one of those tribes can only survive. Both cannot. They are devoted to destroying one another. This is a radical moment. Church, family, I have never seen, in my 41 years of being a Christian, I've never seen all of these players in place like now, regarding Bible prophecy. Of Ezekiel 38, it's amazing. I'll leave this with you. Last, last photo, last slide. This is amazing. Right now, Israel has two friends that if you, if you knew your Bible, I mean, you do, I'm just being hypothetical right now. If you knew your Bible, if you know your Bible, you're going... Wow, this is a miracle. Wow, God, you're close to coming for your people. This is amazing. What is that? It is this, that according to the Bible in the last days, two nations would have to be on Israel's side against a neighborhood of nations that want Israel's destruction. And the Bible tells you who those nations are. Okay, Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Egypt and Sheba and Dedan in the Old Testament. So look at this, Saudi Arabia, the Saudis' religious establishment pushes normalization relations with Israel. The Saudi Arabians, for the first time, as you sit here tonight, world history is made this, this week. Saudi Arabia recognizes, and they're trading now with Israel, and they're exchanging technologies. And Saudi Arabia, Muslims are saying, we want to be friends with Israel. The Shias, Iran, Iranians, want to destroy Saudi Arabia for being renegade because they're acknowledging, you see the triangle, see this? They are acknowledging the existence of Israel by doing trade with Israel. And you can look online, one of the prince, Saudi princes is in a mosque and he's got a, a man purse or a merce or whatever you want to call those things <laughs> and he's holding it like this and it's got Hebrew written on it and he's a Saudi prince in a mosque with it, and they're freaking out. You guys, Egypt has been attacked just these last few weeks by terrorists. And Egypt has turned to Israel, and Israel is working with Egypt on defending its borders. And according to the Bible, in the last days, Egypt and Sheba and Dida and Saudi Arabia will be friends with Israel during a time when Russia, Turkey, and Iran, and its adjoining nations, Libya and Sudan, will attack Israel. The Bible says God will destroy them, but preserved is Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Everything's in place right now. You see, what does this mean? It just simply means you better be ready to meet Jesus. Because I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you right now, this is amazing. Your Bible is alive. It's best to listen to what God has to say. Father, we thank you for this overriding truth and the apex of all Bible prophecy. And it is that Jesus Christ would come into the world to die for the sins of all humanity that Christ would be resurrected from the dead, Savior of the world, the one and only, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the one who was, who is, who is to come, the Almighty, the eternal God, the way, the truth, and the life. 
and that through Jesus and him alone is salvation. Father, thank you that you've given us your word to give us comfort even in times like these. So Lord, let us be focused on finishing our race well, being faithful to you, and telling every man and woman, boy and girl, about the saving grace of Almighty God in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And it's in his name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand, church, as we worship him tonight.